So when you want to do eye movements, we'll talk about eye movements in detail, but I always say that your basic tools are the two eyes that I represented here as two eggs. Egg tart, remember? So that for to make an egg tart, you need two eggs and you need a beta to beat the eggs, okay? So then you can make the egg tarts. So, for example, if I were to ask all of you to look to the left, your eyes will be doing this. Oh, I've uh, got my stuff. Okay, okay. I think I, I, I'm going to, the, the chef is going to interrupt his, the meal so that he can get this. If you don't mind opening it up for me, sir. So, see, doctor, say, can you mind opening it up? Yes. Okay. So, you know, I cannot uh, function without the coffee in the morning. So, as I was saying, so he's looking to the left. These are the two movements, right? So what are the two, two muscles here? So lateral rectus, medial rectus. Okay? Very simple, right? So what do we do next? We connect the lateral rectus to the sixth nerve. We need medial rectus to the third nerve. Okay? So that's basic, right? Very easy. Now, if you are a housewife living on the sixth floor, and you want to talk to another friend who's living on the third floor, you can look out of the window and shout, but you will never be able to bond with her until you get out of the house, press the elevator, and go up to the third floor. Okay? And that elevator is called medial longitudinal fasciculus. Medial longitudinal fasciculus. Okay? Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. So medial longitudinal fasciculus is the connection that allows the sixth nucleus to talk to the third, third nucleus. So we have gotten eye movements to the, to the left now. Okay? So very simple. Look to the left. Lateral rectus connects to six. Medial rectus connects to the third. Then you need an elevator that connects the six to the third. Okay? So we have effected this. So now that we have understood eye movements, we are going to give the same instruction to my favorite patient. Okay? He was my favorite patient because it was Christmas Eve and I was on the way home when the, my registrar called me and said, you must come and see the patient. So I'm actually very glad that I came back to see the patient because you will see that he will teach us a lot. The first thing he's going to tell us is what happens when he tries to look to the left. And I want all of you to try doing this, try doing this, draw the diagram, okay? But silently, okay? I don't want you to give out the answers. So again, uh, most of us are very frightened about eye movements. When we see this, we get very, we, we get very intimidated because there's a lot of things going on. But all I want you to do is, he's asked to look to the left. So what happens when he looks to the left? First of all, there's no problem when he looks to the right. Now when he looks to the left, one eye is moving and the other eye is not moving. Simple as that. And truly, that is as simple as that. So you get something like this. Right? Then you connect it up. Okay? After you have connected up, you realize there are a number of things that can go wrong with this patient. Correct? And this is a comprehensive thing that can go wrong with this patient. Now, when you are on the way home tomorrow, you will be taking an aeroplane. Now, when you take this aeroplane, the pilot, no matter how senior the pilot is, he may be the oldest pilot uh, ever existed in Vietnam, the most experienced, but he cannot take the plane off until he fills up a, a checklist. Now, why is that so? You see, is it because he's happy with 95% safety, 98% safety, 99% safety, or is he looking for 100% safety? He's looking for 100% safety. And because pilots want 100% safety, they have to, no matter what you are, who you are, 
how experienced you are, you have to fill up a checklist. So I only say that as clinicians, no matter how good we think we are, we are dealing with somebody's life or limb. So we cannot afford to be 99% accurate because the 1% is another person, right? So we need to be 100% accurate. To be 100% accurate, you need a checklist. So this checklist tells you all the things that can explain this man's difficulty. Not the most common thing. Now, many of you are taught pattern recognition in medical school. Pattern recognition means you see this, this is the diagnosis. Now, this gets you right 95% of the time, but it's not 100% of the time. To, to be a secure doctor for your patient, for your patient, to be a secure doctor for your patient, you need to be 100% right. And to be 100% right, you need a checklist like this. Because 95% of the time, you would have a patient with this lesion, explaining this patient's problem, medial longitudinal fasciculus. And we will think that we are very good because we are correct 95% of the time. And we won't see the 5% because something will happen to the patient or the patient will go somewhere else, right? So I want you to become the 100% correct doctor, which would mean that you would also consider the rare possibility that this is a restrictive problem, a restriction of the muscle. In the last five years, I had a patient with carcinoma of the breast, that metastasized to the orbit and was restricting the lateral rectus muscle. So therefore the eye wasn't able to aduct. You know, breast cancer often is fibrotic. So metastatic disease is often not space occupying but fibrotic in the case of breast cancer. I had a patient with cystisacosis sitting on the medial rectus muscle and preventing the medial rectus muscle from moving. I had a patient with renal cell carcinoma sitting again on the lateral rectus muscle and preventing the eye from moving. And the clue was, of course, a bit of proptosis. So you want to get it right for these patients. Then, of course, I've at least four or five times, I have had patients who I've diagnosed with this internuclear ophthalmoplegia. And my ophthalmology friends call me and say they have given the patient some Tensilon and the patient is cured because it's actually not internuclear ophthalmoplegia, it's actually myasthenia, okay? So myasthenia is another important cause of this particular eye movement abnormality. Then of course you will consider third nerve, but the problem with the third nerve is if you look carefully, it's got no ptosis, it's got no elevation difficulty, no depression difficulty, and no pupillary abnormality. So it's possible, but less likely. And then of course, we all are familiar with this problem. This is a problem, a connection between the sixth and the third connection problem between the sixth and the third that prevents the medial rectus from moving. And so what happens? The brain is going to send more signals because this muscle is not working because the signal is not going to get through. What happens? Does the signal get through? No, it doesn't get through. But now this poor muscle here is going to get twice the signal. Okay, so more signals are sent down from the brain for the eye to move to the left, still gets blocked here. And now this poor guy gets three times the signal. Okay? Now the brain says, no, I need to move the eye to the left. I'll send some more signals. Still the signal gets blocked here. Now the eye gets four times the signal. So what's going to happen to this eye? It's going to overshoot and come back. Overshoot and come back. Overshoot and come back. So this is the abducting nystagmus that you classically see in problems in medial longitudinal fascicle. So, this patient has three differential diagnoses, muscle neuromuscular junction and an internuclear ophthalmoplegia from a lesion in the medial longitudinal fasciculus. Okay, and less likely, an isolated third. Now, with this four differential diagnoses, I want you to look at the picture again, the video again, and tell me if you can find something that will show that this is more likely to be one over the other. And this is the principle of the zebra stripe. So those of you who work with me know that my favorite animal is the zebra because I often use that to illustrate. If a few animals look the same, in Africa, the antelope, the giraffe, the springbok, not the giraffe, maybe the antelope, zebra, uh, the springbok, and few of these animals look the same. They all eat grass, they are found in the Serengeti, their lions like to eat them, they have the same kind of hoofs, you know, and they gather in, in herds. If you want to know what a zebra looks like, I shouldn't be describing the forelegs, the hoofs, the grass, 
I should be telling you, look for an animal with clear black and white stripes. That will allow you to differentiate a zebra from the others. So in the same way, in this particular case, what will differentiate one condition over the other? Look for a zebra stripe. Anyone? Any zebra stripes? First of all, when he looks to the right, you notice that he has nystagmus. Now, nystagmus can it be seen in muscle disorder, especially if it's this kind of vertical nystagmus. We are not going to be too intimidated by the nystagmus. It just looks like a funny nystagmus, and it's on both eyes. Okay? Can it be seen in a muscle disorder? No. Can it be seen in neuromuscular junction disorder? No. Can it be seen in a third nerve? No. But can it be seen in a central nervous system problem? Like I know, yes. So we have one zebra stripe pointing towards, pointing towards INO as the cause. Okay? And the other thing is the when he looks to the left, there is an abducting nystagmus. This abducting nystagmus that we talked about. Now, this abducting nystagmus is not 100% sign for INO, but it's a very useful sign. So it's most often seen in internuclear ophthalmoplegia, this abducting nystagmus. So, with this, you can make a more definitive diagnosis that this is four possibilities here, but most likely cause will be internuclear ophthalmoplegia. And some of you would have noticed that there's something odd about this patient. Many of you would have thought it's because I'm a lousy cameraman. Actually, I'm not. I'm quite a good cameraman. Okay? It's not because I was holding the camera tilted. It's because this gentleman has a head tilt to the left. Left eye is higher. Right eye is lower, left eye is intorted, right eye is extorted. If you want to know more about that, you have to choose skew deviation, which is another snag, either for today or tomorrow. Okay? And skew deviation is specific for central nervous system pathology. So we have a second clue that tells us that this is internuclear ophthalmoplegia. So now you will tell the radiologist, not the radiologist tell you, please find me a lesion, okay, on the right side of medial longitudinal fasciculus, okay, in the upper pons, and you will I will tell you why it's the upper pons, okay, either upper pons or midbrain, right, upper pons or midbrain of the MLF. That means, that means not here or the sixth floor, but closer towards here, okay, and again, to know why I, we know precisely where it is, you need to choose your snacks properly tomorrow, okay? So this is what the radiologist showed us, okay? As you can imagine, remember the two humps here that looks like the udders of a cow will point to the facial colliculus. So that's a very good localization for you. When you see that, it's a facial colliculus. The facial colliculus is close to the six nucleus, and then the medial longitudinal fasciculus is traveling up towards the midbrain this way. So the lesion is exactly there. Okay? So that's how we prove that this patient has a INO. Okay? With that, I'm going to stop and hand over to Melanie, who's going to give you the next snack. I don't think I've ever heard it described as the udder of the cow. Udder of the cow. That's the yes. first time. My animal bias. So we're going to switch over. In neuro-ophthalmology, there are two areas of con concentration. One is the afferent side, and one is the efferent side. And um, as you can see, when we talk about eye nose and eye movements, and that is considered the efferent side. What I'm going to focus on is the afferent side. What the afferent side is, the vision as it approaches the eye, that travels into the optic nerve, but then goes to the brain and then transfers out to our cognition of the vision. So that's the afferent sign. And what I want to do is give you some ABCs before we start. So today, this is a primer for tomorrow. Tomorrow, a number of different cases in the afferent side of things. 
But the ABCs are important because I want you to engage in this and understand where this comes from, how you detect these afferent visual problems. So we'll start off first. Visual cuties. Have you ever seen visual cuties and what it means? Visual cuties themselves tell us a number of different things that's quite important by the vision system and the neurologic system. And so this is easy to have. You can get one of these cards. You can get an application app on your phone as well so that you can check um, patient's vision. So the implications of this is that, you know, if there are problems with the eye itself, you can certainly have decreased visual acuity. Um, anything from a refractive barrier error or any corneal problems or irregularities in the cornea. You can have amblyopia. You can have um, things that occur in developmental of the eye itself that can cause decreased vision. Neurologically, it doesn't occur until you get past that. So past the retina, past the, um, when you approach the optic nerve, the chiasm, and so forth. Certainly you can have decreased acuity, but in particular, there's a way to differentiate those two. So one of the things we do is we look at the integrity of the optic nerve and the optics of the eye and the neural system that approaches the eye to the optic nerve. And what we're doing with visual acuities is we're helping to determine how that patient is able to detect the smallest size stimulus possible and whether they can resolute that and whether they can identify it. So sometimes you can see something, but you can't recognize or identify what it is, whether the letter is an A, the number is a one or two. So knowing that is quite important because then you can know what the patient is able to cognize. So if they can actually recognize those letters or numbers. Always start systematically, just like your neuro exam. When you approach your neuro exam with the mental status, you want to approach vision the same way. Start with the right eye move to the left eye, and then do both eyes. If you follow that format, it's very hard to forget. It becomes automatic, and that's what you want. In a, neuro a neurologic exam, it's the same way. So that's how I would approach it. Start with the top, move all, uh, start with the bottom actually, and move all the way up as they go. So when you start at the very lowest line, if they can't see that, then you ask, well, go up a little higher. And if they still can't see that, well, go up a little higher, slowly at a time. That's going to give you the best acuity that you can get from that patient. And recording the visual acuities. In America, we use our English system. We still do, even though we're not part of you know, the UK. So, uh, But we denote our vision in 2020s or 2200. That's equivalent to about six meters. So you can convert that into the metric system as well. So how are you going to differentiate someone who has decreased vision and you think, well, I think this is all vision related. They need to see the ophthalmologist as opposed to, oh, they actually have a neurologic problem. I need to investigate this further. So you want to see if they can increase, um, improve their vision with a pinhole effect. Have you ever seen a pinhole before? Have you ever done this? So we do have um, apparatuses that in, have pinholes in them. But you know, if you don't have it at the bedside, it's quite easy. Take a sheet of paper, poke a pin, little hole through it, and have the patient look through the pin hole. It decreases the blur. And how it does that is it actually increases the depth of focus. And a lot of times patients are very surprised because they can see again. Um, but truly, you don't want to be seeing through a very tiny hole because your field is quite constricted. You don't want to be driving around like that. But it certainly helps you so that you can determine that this patient, if they improve with their vision with a pinhole, that means this is due to the eyes mainly, if not the brain, and that's quite helpful. So things that can improve with pinhole, refractive areas, eras, um, corneal disruptions, or lens disruptions like cataracts, and that's um, something that you can appreciate early on. Um, when patients can't see beyond the chart that you give them, what else can you do? Um, there is a systematic way of approaching that. 
starting off with whether they can actually see your fingers when you present them at certain distances. Usually start off as far as you can, six meters, moving your way up to close to one meter or so, and even to their face. Uh, starting with counting the fingers, you know, show them one, two, or five. And then um, if they can't see that, hand motion, have them see if they can actually detect your hands moving. And then as they move even closer and you can't, they still can't see that, whether they can actually see light and which direction the light comes in. When they can only see light, that's light perception. But if they're able to tell you which direction the light is coming from, that's light projection. And that's helpful also to tell you the degree of vision loss that they have. So how is this helpful? In neuro-ophthalmology, there are quite a few optic nerve issues. Um, for instance, if they have swelling of the nerve due to increased intracranial pressure, papilledema, their vision can, can you know, start from 2020 up to 2400, and some patients count fingers depending on how much swelling can occur. Glaucoma, inflammatory idiopathic optic neuritis, you can see 2200 or better typically. Uh, and I realize in the United States, we can consider this isolated idiopathic optic neuritis as typical versus NMO and MOGAD as atypical. But I realize in the East, it's quite the opposite. You see more NMOSD compared to us. We see more MS-related optic neuritis. And the difference in vision is that in MS patients, they're 2,200 or better typically 2,400, and when you don't really have to treat them with steroids, and they do recover their vision. As opposed to NMO and MOGAD, steroids is the first line, and certainly you, you need to admit in many cases because the vision loss is quite severe. And you have other neurologic symptoms with it too, you definitely want to admit and treat high-dose steroids, possibly IVIG or plasma exchange accordingly. In compressive optic neuropathy, 2200 or better, maybe a slower progression. So maybe they had it a month ago and slowly is progressing. If someone progresses quite rapidly, rapidly, you may not consider that compressive unless it's a hemorrhage and something's happening quite acute. Uh, hereditary optic neuropathy and then uh, toxic metabolic um, can start at 20 and progress. In um, hereditary optic neuropathy, uh, in particular, labors and um, dominant optic atrophy, um, they tend to start with central visual acuity affected first. So you see that their acuity in decreases very significantly early on. All right, so that's visual acuity. And that's how you can differentiate the eye versus the brain when you're looking at that. Color vision is another ABCs of optic neuropathy and op in neuropathology. In color vision, it's quite important because most optic nerve problems causes decreased color vision, like color saturation. We in the United States typically use the Ishihara plates, but certainly you have um, apps that are available on your phones that you can use as well. That's pretty handy. Um, obviously, you don't want to carry the books around. In some cases, in the United States, actually, when I was a neurology resident, I actually carried it around in my neurology bag so I can uh, see patients offhand and know whether there's an optic nerve problem. So um, Ishihara, um, they need to see 2200 or 6 over 60 or better to see that control plate. If they can't see that, it's really hard to do the testing. Um, there are other ways, of course, you can use a red cap and see if there's changes in color and they can notice the difference between the two eyes. And um, essentially what I can tell you is that there's an abnormal optic nerve function. And that's quite helpful determining whether there's something acutely going on versus something centrally. Now the question is though, can you have something in the brain itself that can cause decreased color vision? Have you seen this before? I see some head nods. So that's great, agreed. In fact, you can, if you have a stroke or a lesion in the medial occipital lobe, you can develop what's called achromatopsia. And this achromatopsia um, is quite significant. They actually see uh, black and white as opposed to color. I had a patient who had a, a stroke, a young lady about 30 to 40 years old. She developed a stroke in that specific area, and she saw brown of everything instead of color. So it's uh, definitely possible in the central nervous system. So keep that in mind. How does this apply to many of the neuro issues? So
So in papilloma, maybe normal. In glaucoma, normal. In inflammatory, such as idiopathic or NMO or MOGAD, you can have decreased color vision significantly, uh, even early on. That's one of the ways to detect the optic nerve problem. Uh, in vascular, where there's non-arteric ischemic optic neuropathy or arteritic, like giant cell arteritis, you certainly can have color vision problems. Um, and in hereditary and uh, toxic metabolic, again, those are the things we look for to determine if there's something going on to the optic nerve and the brain as opposed to just the eye itself. So those are the two ABCs so far. I have a couple more as we proceed this morning so that you're prepared for tomorrow. While we're switching over, is there any questions? So, next uh, item in the menu today. So, you're going to use the 2x and the 8 beta to analyze why this lady, when she's looking to the right at the red pin, nothing is moving. Okay? So, as I said before, first thing is, Calm yourself down and tell yourself that you will be able to work it out if you go through the steps. Then after that, in the next picture, she's looking to the left. Okay, and then figure out what is what is not moving. Okay. Um, so, Dr. Mia reminds me to use the mic. So basically, the first picture, draw the two X. Second picture, draw the two X and tell me what's wrong. So. I'm, I can see many of you are furiously drawing away, okay? But for those of you who are not drawing, okay, the first picture should look like this, okay? Because both arrows are red, and the only parsimonious way to make both arrows red would be to put a lesion in the right six nucleus, okay? Now, she decides to look to the left. And when she looks to the left, you realize that the right eye adduction is affected. And one easy way of explaining that, of the many reasons we talked about, okay, you could put a lesion here, you could put a lesion here, you could have put a lesion here, or you could put a lesion here, okay, one of the four. Now, we combine both these pictures, and we realize that if we indeed put a lesion close to the elevator, the medial longitudinal fasciculus, Okay, you realize that it's just next to the six nucleus. Okay, it's the same side of the brain, right side. It is the same SITE side of the brain, the pons. So it is a parsimonious explanation. In neurology, in medicine, we always want to find the simplest explanation for something that looks complex, right? So the simplest explanation would be a lesion, whether it's ischemic, demyelinating, or space occupying lesion that's sitting on the right side of the pons, it doesn't need to be very big. All it needs to do is occupy the six nucleus and the adjacent medial longitudinal fasciculus, and it will explain red arrow, red arrow, red arrow. Okay, so you have solved this lady's problem, and now you can tell the radiologist, not the radiologist tell you, please find me a lesion on the right side of the pons, okay, close to the six nucleus, close to the others. Okay, and it should be occupying not just the six nucleus area, but above that and slightly pressing onto the medial longitudinal fasciculus. Okay, any questions? So some of you will remember this as the one and a half syndrome. Now the problem with remembering by just pattern recognition is that, you know, it relies on memory, but I've just shown you, you don't need to rely on memory. You can just work it out by drawing the two X and the arrows. Okay. Okay. So I'll hand over the mic to Melanie. And I think I didn't bring my instruments down. I'll go and get my instruments so okay. that you can demonstrate some of the, the stuff. Um, the next, after Melanie, we will be uh, having a snack here. Ugok, which is a little bit oily. So, but I think you're prepared now to have Ugok. All right, to continue with the ABCs, I guess we're at C's now. Um, the next topic, 
is one of my favorites, his pupils. So I was trained in Iowa as one of my fellowships, and one of my mentors is Dr. Uh, Randy Cardin, and he is a specialist in pupils. And you would think there's only two pupils, how can you not be a specialist at it? But when I went to train with him, there is two large textbooks dedicated just to pupils alone. So I find it very interesting, um, and obviously a little more complex, but um, there's so much to learn about the pupil. So pupils, um, what's the function of it? It controls illumination, improves the optical quality when you're looking through things. When it constricts, it increases your depth of focus. And, and it allows that range so that things appear sharper. It is part of your accommodative system. And what does, when we evaluate pupils, I don't know if you use the same acronym, but PERLA is what we use. And PERLA stands for pupils equal, round, reactive to light, and accommodation. And so th those letters are just reminders that that's what we should be looking for when we're checking pupils. So are they round? Are they equal? Are they reactive to light? And do they accommodate to near point constriction? So the technique of um, checking pupil start always to look at the size of the pupil because the size of the pupil ra ranges and it differs according to people. Um, as we age, uh, when we're younger, our pupils are larger. As we age, it gets smaller. You'll find that our elderly patients, their pupils are very tiny. You'll have to dilate to look in inside. Um, they range from one millimeter to 10 millimeter in size. Um, and they can be variable to day to day. In fact, I don't know if you know, if you drink a lot of caffeine or coffee, your pupils actually get large. And I can tell right away when someone comes in who's had a lot of coffee. Um, and whereas if you're digesting and resting, your pupils are much smaller because that's your parasympathetic system activating. Right. So symmetry between the pupil, whether they're equal or not. If they're unequal, certainly there uh, can be a neurologic problem, or it could be just the physiologic size of things for them. But we determine that when we examine them. Um, and what, what is it? Measure the difference in, in size between the two. And you also want to measure it in bright light as opposed to dim light because then you're looking at different systems, whether it's the sympathetic system versus the parasympathetic system. And this is why you wanna measure in the different lights. Now, when you have different sizes in pupils, that's what anisocoria means, different sizes of pupil. What are the different causes? There are a number of different causes depending on how they react in the light versus the dark, but Horner's is one. Horner's is due to a sympathetic problem third nerve palsy. Migraine patients will also develop a pupil problem. Some people will have a mydriasis that can occur. Um, if they put eye drops in, uh, I don't know if you use bromamine, sometimes that can happen. Um, and then any congenital or uh, trauma to the eye or to iris. And in 20% of the patient population or us in general, it's about 20% of people will have a size difference about one millimeter difference. And they react the same in bright light and dim light. That is physiologic. And that's what we look for too, in order to make sure there isn't a neurologic underlining. Okay, so whether the pupils are round, oval, misshapen, distorted, definitely describe it. And often as neurologists, and I, I don't fault you, it's just that you're not being trained at this to look at it, but hopefully by today, when you get out there and you look at your patients, you'll pay attention to the shape as well. And that's quite helpful to determine if their vision loss is due to distortion itself and not due to neurologic problem. Right, so pupil asymmetry, as we talked about, and Lisa Corey is unequal size pupil. We talked about whether it's physiologic or pathologic and whether um, the anisocoria is greater in bright light and dim light. So I'm gonna give you an example here. This is a video of a patient who has anisocoria. And we're gonna go through the exam. Guess it's not working. Let's see. 
Okay, thank you. So when you're checking pupils, you notice how the light comes from the bottom, radiating up. That way you can see the pupil better. This is called alternating swinging flashlight test. And what you're doing here is to determine if one doesn't react over the other, or relaxes reaction over the other. And here we're doing near point to determine if there's light near dissociation. So this patient, you may see that the right eye, the pupil is smaller, the left eye, the pupil is larger. But in bright light, it looks exactly the same as in dim light. We'll look at it again. So that right eye constricts. That left eye is larger, but it also constricts. And it constricts the same amount equally between the two. So this is physiologic anisocoria. In pupil testing, there is a specific way of testing that, those pupils, whether it's using initially the direct. And in direct light, you're shining it in one eye, and you're looking at that same eye to see how fast it reacts and from which size to which size, um, so that you can determine how brisk and um, if there's any asymmetry. So you start, always start with the right eye, then move to the left eye, and after that, then you can do the next, which is the um, swinging flashlight test. So here's the technique. It's another video. There you go. There's your right. You can see how it constricts very briskly. Left, very brisk. Again, right. So that is called direct and it's a brisk reaction. This is the swinging flashlight. And what you're looking for is any release of the constriction. And he does not have a relative afferent pupillary defect. He's a normal patient. So that's usually the technique on how you approach that. Now, what if you have what's called a relative afferent pupillary defect? And that actually helps us to localize to that side in particular, which optic nerve is affected. So in a dark room, same as the previous steps, shine the light in the right eye, swing it over to the left eye. You might ask me, well, how fast do you go? Sure. So how fast do you go? It varies. And how bright does the light need to be? It also varies. Depending on the person and how cooperative the person is, so I usually try to be as um, eye level as possible. So assume I'm sitting next to you here in front of you. I start off with the right eye, and I see how fast it constricts. And um, his constricts very nice, very brief. I do it about three times so that I can see how fast his pupils are constricting. And I'll tell you, his pupils are round. <laughs> Looking straight ahead again. And what I normally do is I turn the light dimmed and I have the patient look straight ahead so they're not focusing on my light. And again, on the left side, about one to two seconds. If you need a guidance, what I normally do is I count and say one, one thousand, two, one thousand, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, and back and forth again. Now, the swinging flashlight test can vary. In some cases, you can accentuate and increase the ability to recognize the relative afferent people are defect by actually slowing it down a little and moving it slowly. In other cases, you can actually decrease the intensity, and that can also bring a very subtle relative afferent pupillary defect. When I first did this as a neurology resident, thank you, sir. As a neurology resident, I thought I had to bring the light really bright, and I had to swing it back, um, back and forth. I thought we needed that high intensity. That's not true. In the ICU, yes because most of our patients are obtunded. They're not very well aware of what's going on. That bright light's probably important. But when you're sitting face to face and the patient's able to talk to you, you can vary the intensity. And that will give you a better assessment of the pupils. All right. 
So as you recall, the pathway of the pupil is why I help to understand why this becomes a neurologic problem. In fact, when the light is shining in, it travels through the ciliary ganglion. It sends a signal all the way to the midbrain, the tectum. It actually sends them to the edinger edin wall. From the edinger edin wall, it goes to two areas. It's duly um, sent out, and then the efferent end goes back to the ciliary ganglion to the pupil itself to constrict. So lesions in any of those areas can cause pupil problems. And so I'll give you some examples. This one here is um, showing some of the different ways in which you can grade a relative afferent pupillary defect. Um, the, you can either do it a number of times, actually know how much a percentage has occurred, and you can grade it that way. You can also use what's called neutral density filters. You can actually purchase this. Um, and the neutral density filters you can use in gradients so that you can neutralize and put that lens over the good eye to uh, make it equal to the supposed relative apparent eye. And that allows you a more accurate measurement of the relative afferent pupillary defect. Um, I actually use that in clinic every day. I carry it in my bag, and in each of my exam room, I have it in there as well. So uh, for trainees, that's quite helpful because then you can learn how to do it and actually see the reverse of it itself. It's a little more accurate to me. So I use that. This is a patient who has, you tell me which side. So the light constricts, it constricts, looks pretty good so far. Here's our swinging flashlight. So I hope you see that in the right eye. That right eye relaxes immediately as soon as it goes over. So that's a right relative afferent pupillary defect. What does that tell us? That tells us something must be going on to the right optic nerve or the right, the left tract, depending on, because the cross fibers are on the other side. Those um, relative afferent pupillary defects due to the tract lesions are subtle. So when I see this, I more than likely think there's something going on to the optic nerve itself. And that's a very good indication. Let's move on. Here's another one. You can see that the direct response is normal. And that should show you that's the other side. And you can pick that up pretty well. So when I neutralize it, I would put the lens with the neutral density on the right side until the both of them won't do that anymore. And that's how I would grade that. All right, moving on. Um, as you recall, that pathway of the pupil goes to the tectum. There is a phenomenon known as light near dissociation. So in patients who have lost their vision in both eyes, the pathway to accommodation is separate. And you can ch still check the action of the pupil. So in both eyes, when you shine the light in someone who's lost vision in the right eye, someone who's lost vision in the left eye also, they may not respond. But if you ask them to focus at near, they can. And so the problem becomes, well, if they can't see, how can you tell them to look up close? Where do they look? Remember, as neurologists, we know that they still have proprioception. So what we normally do is have them take their thumb up and say, hey, here's your thumb. Can you look at your thumb for me? And when they do that, they are able to constrict. So when you cannot react re re to light, but you still react to near, that is called light near dissociation. And there are a number of other things that can do that besides loss of vision in both eyes. I usually tell my residents that there are five things I want them to list to me if they cannot have, if a patient has light near dissociation. So here's an example of a patient with light near dissociation. Can you appreciate that 
He's not really reacting to the light. And his pupils are about mid-size, but no reaction to light. But as you can see, it constricts very tiny when it's up close. So that's light near dissociation. So the five things that can do that, one we already talked about, which is loss of vision in both eyes. Another one my resident will tell me right away is the Argyle Robertson pupil, which is associated with syphilitic infection and affecting the tectum. Another very more emergent problem would be if you saw this patient in the ER, they came abruptly and this happened to them, you probably want neuroimaging because they may have something growing and pushing on the midbrain itself called a dorsal midbrain syndrome. You can have an aberrant regeneration of the third nerve that can do that. And then Addy's tonic pupil where the ciliary ganglion has been degenerated. So those are the scenarios in which light near dissociation can occur. All right. The importance of pupil testing is that we certainly can differentiate many of the neurologic con conditions related to these. Like Horner syndrome, you can find a dissection, you may find a tumor. I'm not gonna go into detail about that because I think um, Uma is gonna talk about that tomorrow. So that's another primer for you to come back tomorrow. And then third nerve palsies, um, iris defects, are, um, it helps us to localize lesions also. All right, so I'm gonna pass this back. So as promised, we're going to have Uga. No, wrong. So the official title is Pre and Supranuclear Influences, but let's not um, worry about that. Just think about the delicious snack in front of you. So this lady is asked to look to the left. Look to the right. No, you should. As far as you can to the left. She can't look to the left. Right. Just, right. No, you should. As far as you can to the left. She can't look to the left. Okay. So what you're going to do? You're going to whip out your pen and a piece of paper. You're going to draw the two X and the arrows, and you're going to show me that both arrows are red. So if you connect up everything, even if you give this to your child today the child will tell you that the only way to make both arrows red with one lesion would be the six nucleus. Okay? You put it here, only this will be red. If you put it here, only this will be red. If you put it here, only this will be red. If you want both of them to be red, it has to be the six nucleus. So therefore, you realize the six nucleus is also known as the lateral gaze center because it is responsible for ipsilateral gaze. It's got motor neurons for the six nucleus, and it's got interneurons that cross over to the other side to form the uh, medial longitudinal fasciculus. Now, the only problem with this is that I have not talked to you about volitional, voluntary eye movements. As you know, we all have the free will. So you had a will today, you could have decided to go to the beach, you could have decided to go to to the breakfast table, or you could have decided to come here, you chose to do something. You choose to do something. And that free will is located in your soul. Not S-O-L-E, but in your S-O-U-L. And where is your S-O-U-L? Well, it's in the frontal lobe. Okay, don't believe the cardiologists because they want everybody to put their hands over the heart and sing the national anthem. There's nothing there. The soul is here. So next time you're singing the national anthem, it has to be like this. Okay? So the soul will tell you, do this, do that. Marry this person, buy this car, go to this conference, you know? That's what your soul will tell you. So the same way, the frontal lobe, the soul in your frontal lobe will tell you, move your eyes to the left or to the right. Okay? But the only part that I need you to memorize today, so far we haven't told you anything to memorize, right? Is that the frontal eye fields are crossed. The frontal eye fields, which control the sole of the eye movements, is in the frontal lobe, just like the sole of any of your things is in the frontal lobe. Okay, so whatever decisions you make, it has to be initiated in the frontal lobe. Now, but why is it crossed? 
nobody really knows actually. So it's a bit of a mystery. Probably somebody will win the Nobel Prize if they can figure out why, why some fibers are crossed, some fibers are not crossed. But that's another topic for another day. Okay, so frontal eye fields are crossed. So therefore, you realize that this lady's inability to look to the left could be due to a problem in the nucleus, a nuclear horizontal gaze palsy, nuclear horizontal gaze palsy, or it could be a supranuclear horizontal gaze palsy. So I've just introduced some new terms for you. Now, as neurologists, you will probably be confused why suddenly there's a new terminology. Because as neurologists, you would have just said, lower motor neuron, horizontal gaze palsy, and upper motor neuron, horizontal gaze palsy. But unfortunately, neuro-ophthalmology is dominated by ophthalmologists who like to confuse everybody. They don't even refer to the right eye as the right eye, the left eye as the left eye. So they have terms that nobody understands. What's OU? What's OS? What's OD? Right? Nobody knows all these terms. They like to have different terms. So to just confuse everybody, they decided not to call this upper motor neuron horizontal gaze palsy, lower motor neuron horizontal gaze palsy to look special. They have decided to call this supranuclear horizontal gaze palsy and nuclear horizontal gaze palsy. So you realize that this lady now has got two possibilities, right? She can't look to the left because it could be a nuclear horizontal gaze palsy or a supranuclear horizontal gaze palsy. So how do you differentiate that? Well, as the patient is walking into the clinic, okay, the person with the right frontal lobe lesion will be hemiplegic on this side. She'll be walking in like this. She can't look to the left and this side will be plegic. Correct? As the patient is walking into the clinic. If the patient with a nuclear, with a nuclear gaze palsy cannot look to the left, but where will the hemiplegia be? This side. And she'll be walking in like this. So as your nurse is opening the door and the patient is walking in, you already made the diagnosis. But then we can't charge the patient if that's all you do, right? So you'll get the patient to sit on the chair. And as the patient is sitting on the chair, you realize that the face looks funny. This patient would have a upper motor neuron facial palsy, right? This patient would have a low motor neuron facial palsy because we know the seventh nerve crosses around the sixth nucleus before it goes up. So the sixth nucleus lesion often causes ipsilateral lower motor neuron facial palsy. While we know that frontal lobe lesions like your MCA strokes and all that will cause contralateral upper motor neuron facial palsy. So as the patient is sitting in front of you, you've already decided that the patient is nuclear or supranuclear. But again, I always feel this very strongly that we must always touch our patients. If we don't touch our patients, the therapeutic contract is broken. Okay? So even if we don't do anything, touching the patient makes them feel better. So we cannot possibly send this patient away without touching. So what do we do? We touch the patient. And that's what Dr. Z is doing here. He's holding the head and moving the patient's head. And again, demonstrating one other method of differentiating supranuclear from nuclear horizontal gaze palsy by using the doll's response or better known as the vestibular ocular response. Vestibular ocular response. So vestibular ocular response means the vestibular system is connected to the ocular system. But so far in this diagram that I've drawn for you, I have not connected the vestibular system at all. So how shall we do that? And I promise that the only thing you need to memorize today is frontal eye fields are crossed. So everything else you should be able to work out. So to work out like what I was demonstrating yesterday, we need to go back and dissect my mastoid bone. Okay, so I'm trying to project my voice because I think you can hear me. So if you were to dissect my mastoid bone on both sides, okay, and then for the purpose of illustration, enlarge my semicircular canal. You will find three semicircular canals, one horizontal, one superior, and one posterior. Okay, on that this side, behind my mastoid bone, there will be three. One horizontal, one superior, and one posterior. Okay, and they are filled with, they are filled with endolymph. And endolymph will move. 
pendulum will move just like this. Right? It will move. When it moves, it causes waves. And the waves will be picked up by hand shells. And that's how your brain knows that your head is moving to the left or to the right. That allows us to fixate. Like for example, I'm talking to you. I want to look at you while I'm talking to you. Of course, I can use my frontal lobe to say, look at you, look at you, look at you, look at you. And all the energy will be spent on looking at you. Then I wouldn't know what to say. But what if I relegate my looking at you to a reflex? Then I can automatically look at you all the time. And my frontal lobe now is free to tell you what I need to tell you. Right? So that's why we evolved this reflex. Okay? So, while I'm looking at the gentleman with a blue checkered shirt on, I'm turning my head to the left. My right eye was abductic. My left eye was adductic. Which nucleus must be active for that? Right eye is abductic, left eye is adductic. For that to happen, it is the right six nucleus. Right? Now, if I immediately turn my head to the other side, my eyes are still looking at you because my left eye was abductive, my right eye is adductive. So, which nucleus is active? My left six nucleus. So, we have sorted out the different pathway of the ocular cephalicus. All we now need to figure out is how to connect the afferent to the efferent. Okay, so when I'm moving, the semicircular canals are. Um, uh, are being agitated on both sides. Now, today if you go to the beach, you will see that the ocean currents are very smooth and you will not realize how strong they are until they hit the beach. When they hit the beach, you will see the waves. And again, as the water recedes, it's very quiet again. So in other words, the currents are strong, but you will not know until you hit them. So if you remember that analogy, when I'm moving my head to the left, Fluid is moving away from the wall. Here it's hitting the wall. Correct? If I move my head to this side, the fluid is moving towards the wall of the semicircular canal. Here it is away from the wall. So if you use this analogy, you realize that waves will be stronger when it hits the wall rather than when it's moving away, just like ocean currents. Right? So therefore, this should tell you that when I move my head to the left, this should have more agitation than this side. When I move my head to this side, again because it's hitting the wall, there should be more agitation on this side than this side. So therefore, you realize that when I move my head to the left, this side is more agitated, but my right six nucleus is active. So therefore, for the vestibular ocular system to work, my left, my left vestibular system must be connected to the right six nucleus. So now we have effected a complete pre-nuclear, remember we talked about a supranuclear influence, this is a pre-nuclear influence, a very important pre-nuclear influence on horizontal plane movement, and that is the ocular cephalic system. So now with this diagram now, you know that there is one additional tool to in, allows you to touch the patient now. You can touch the patient and move the patient left and right, like what Dr. Z was doing. Right the camera, please. Right the camera. Uh -huh. So with the VOR, there's no real. So there was no movement, no overcoming the deficit. So if the patient's lesion was here, if you do the VOR, it should be normal. But if the lesion is in the horizontal gaze for C, if you do the VOR, it will be abnormal. So now you have a third way of differentiating nuclear and supranuclear gaze policy. So in summary, horizontal eye movements are controlled in this diagram that I mentioned to you, which is mediated through the sixth nucleus and the third nucleus and with an intermediate medial longitudinal fasciculus. Now the influence for volitional control comes from the contralateral frontal eye field and for reflex, ocular catholic reflex, it's coming from the contralateral eight nucleus. Okay, so with this knowledge, you will be able to differentiate horizontal gaze palsy that is due to a nuclear lesion from a horizontal gaze palsy from a supranuclear lesion. So big part.
a big sensation. So one of the things that we can do, and very easily on the bed, in the bedside, is to determine a patient's visual function, not just from visual acuity and color vision and uh, what we did with pupils, but confrontation fields. Confrontation fields is an easy, quick way to determine an area of vision loss in the periphery or central. And it can give you a lot of details and clues as to where things are happening if you already have a lesion that's occurring through the neurologic system. For instance, if someone has a weak arm on the right side suddenly and comes in and also says, well, I can't see on the right side, it certainly helps you to determine how big that lesion is, whether it's a stroke or if it's something that's chronically going on. Um, so that adds to your neurologic exam in a big way. And I always tell my residents, it's not confrontational. We're doing a confrontation field. We're not trying to argue with each other on this. So in confrontation field, it's quite easy. It's a setup that you can do in the office. I'm going to ask for a volunteer as well again. Yeah. Thank you. So um, typically we start off anywhere from four feet or um, what is that in meters? Four feet? One meter approximately. And you can move up closer as well. As you can see, I'm quite American, so I use the uh, English system. So at four feet, I, I'm going to divide and we're going to do one eye at a time. Always start with the right, then move to the left. Again, that's an easy way to remember and do any type of testing for ophthalmologic sign. So if you don't mind my patient here, would you cover your left eye for me? Okay, as you're covering the left eye, I'm gonna start approaching, I'm gonna actually do it two feet first. And so always eye level, and so I'm gonna show you my ability to squat here. Um, I'm gonna have you look at my nose, okay? I'm gonna close the same eye so I actually see the same thing that he sees. So, looking at my nose, how many fingers do you see there? And how many here? And then how many here? And how many there? So, I've split the visual field into quadrants, four quadrants, so that I can check the ability for him to see. If he can't see an area, he won't be able to tell me what it is, typically. Um, it can be a little more, um, this is more of a, a screening test. So, you're looking at very large defects if you're looking at smaller defects, there are other techniques to, to that as well. So that's the start. That's peripheral vision. Now, if you're wanting to look at central vision, what I normally do is I have my patient look at my nose. Can you see my nose? If he can see my nose, that means the central vision is okay. If he can't see my nose, then I'll know, indeed, his central vision is affected. So that part is called facial ampsler. So you're looking at my nose. Now, if someone comes in and their visual acuity is really dampened and you're not sure if they actually can see or not centrally, certainly you can start off by saying, hi, can you see my nose? And if you can, can you describe what you see right now? Do you see my face, my hair, the color? And that's also helpful too. I'm gonna do the other eye. Can you cover your left eye? Same thing, now look at my nose. At the same time, I'm covering this eye so I can see the exact same thing he sees. So, that allows us to get that four quadrant in each eye. Now, often I don't have to do both eyes. In some cases I might, depending on um, the disposition of the patient, if I think there's a psychological or psychosomatic effect to it. Thank you, sir. So it's a quick and rapid way of doing that. Now, if you're in the ICU, as we talked about earlier, and the patient is laying flat, that's harder to do, but certainly you can still uh, make sure that you're within the eye level of the patient, covering the same eye. Make sure you patch them. If they can't cover it, you can certainly put it over something in the eye to do that. And that will certainly give you an indication of areas of vision, whether it's neurologic or non-neurologic. So from there, I'm going to move on to this part. I think this is going to be more helpful because now that you've gotten some ABCs, of the neuro-ophthalmic I'd like to show you some of the localization powers that you may have. So I tell my residents also when they first come into neuro-ophthalmology or ophthalmology, I feel like a neuro-ophthalmologist is a superpower. I have some superpowers when I'm looking at you because 
the things I'm able to determine with my exam helps me to localize very specifically where things are. I consider that a super power. And you can have it too if you get these skills down. So, when it comes to visual field defects, you want to know whether this is going to be localizing to the brain versus not. Typically, if it's a visual field defect that's on one side, you want to localize it to that optic nerve. That's very typical. There's always exceptions. That's why I say I use the word typical, because there are always atypical situations too. But for the most part, over 90% of the time, if you see a visual field defect that is only in one eye, that's going to concentrate in the retina and in the eye itself, or possibly in the optic nerve. Okay, so the pattern of it is very helpful to denote that this is in the eye itself. The first one is a central defect, and that central defect usually concentrates on what we call the maculopapular bundle, which is the bundle that goes from the macula to the optic nerve. And this is why we get that characteristic visual field defect. That one in the third, that's called an arcuate defect. And that really follows the pattern of the nerve fiber layer in the retina itself. And that's how I also know that it's located in the eye. And additionally, if you can see the other one, that's a nasal defect. And that's typically in the eye also. When it comes to the central nervous system visual field defects, it tends to respect what we call the vertical meridian. It tends to be one side, right side, or left side. It's not necessarily respecting the horizontal, typically. I say typically again, because there are going to be exceptions. So if it borders and aligns the vertical meridian, if it's on the same side, it's called homonymous hemianopsia. So on the same side of the right eye and the left eye versus the right side of the right eye and the left eye. If it's not on the same side, whether it is bitemporal, the outside periphery in both, that can be a neurologic concern as well. Um, visual field defects usually occur on the opposite side of the visual space, and that typically uh, corresponds to areas in the chiasm and beyond. So keep that in mind. As I said earlier, that's the um, area of the nerve fiber bundle. This, this is a representation of how the nerves fibers are arranged in the retina itself, and you can see how it arc it arcs out this way and that way in the other side. And that's why if you have a defect that is specific to that area, let's just say, I'm going to step up here, if you have a lesion in the retina that follows this pattern, then you're going to get a visual defect that's arcuate. If you have an area that's in this area, you can see it's a central scotoma or a secocentral scotoma. So those are some of the patterns that's related to the retina. Additionally, you have that arcuate and altitudinal defect. This is very common in the optic nerve. The altitudinal defect is a very common one found in non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. So ischemia to the optic nerve can induce this. And then in some cases, we have this, what's called a temporal wedge, which is damage to the retinal bundle that originates in the nasal side. And we'll see that area there that's affected. So again, this is some of the areas that's anterior to the retro bulbar optic nerve. All right, how about posterior? So we talked about that bitemporal hemianopsia on the opposite side of the visual um, axis. And that typically localizes to the optic chiasm. So you can think of things that can occur there, uh, very common in pituitary tumors. Temporal hemianopsia, so a uh, hemianopsia that's on one side, that is still considered, if it respects the vertical meridian, you do still want to consider that that's a neurologic problem. In particular, if it occurs in the anterior part of the optic nerve, and anterior to the chiasm. And then if you're right at the chiasm, that down here is called a junctional defect. That means one eye is affected in central and then the other has a hemianopsia. So that's a junctional defect. So again, these are some of your ABCs. And as you can see already, if you can see and identify the pattern of vision loss, you can localize where inside the brain things are happening. And that's why I say this is a superpower. So if you have damage to 
the optic re radiation from the chiasm down to the lateral geniculate and the optic radiations, you get what's called a homonymous hemianopsia. And that's also congruous, meaning that it's very the exact same. It's not irregular, one is not different from the other. It's on the same side and it respects that vertical meridian. In this one, this is also a homonymous hemianopsia, but it's not the same. It is irregular. It's, that's called incongruous. So congruous is exactly the same. Incongruous is different, even though it's on the same side of the visual field axis. And you can have anything from masses to lesions, and certainly strokes can occur here too. In the lateral geniculate, right before it gets the optic chiasm, I'm past the chiasm, but optic radiation. So you're looking at where the optic nerve starts and it crosses over, and then it synapses on the lateral geniculate. That's the first synapse. I call that the first bus stop. And from that bus stop, then you take another pathway that goes from the optic radiation to the occipital lobe. So if you have a lesion here, depending on the blood vessel that is affected, you can have these visual field defects. And in particular, this is the anterior choroidal artery that comes from the internal carotid artery. And then damage to lateral geniculate caused by the posterior choroidal artery, you can see the pattern is different there too. Uh, that's due to the difference in blood supply. So when you see this visual field defect, that's quite helpful to isolate specifically to that area, the lateral geniculate. Now that's really specific. So uh, again, another pattern to recognize. Another one we often uh, learn in medical school, this is one of the first ones we learn. This is homonymous hemianopsia that is in the superior quadrant. We call it a pie in the sky. We don't know what a pie is in, in the United States. We have a lot of apple pies and pumpkin pies. So if you have a slice of it, that's a pie in the sky. So that correlates to the Myers loop in the temporal lobe on the opposite side. So if you see a pie in the sky, you think lesion in the temporal lobe. And then if you have a, I guess this would be pie in the floor. Um, that in the lower quadrant, that usually corresponds to the parietal lobe. So I guess you're spilling the pie at this point. And then if you have a paracentral defect, Typically, when we see a paracentral defect, we can actually think it's in the optic nerve in the eye itself. But in both eyes, when it is homonymous and corresponds, as you can see, in the same location, um, this localizes to a very specific area in the occipital lobe. So keep that in mind because um, there may be a case tomorrow that uh, demonstrates this in a very specific area. And then you can have what's called macular sparing, which is a homonymous hemianopsia where you notice the central part of the vision is not affected, and that also, again, localizes very specifically to the uh, occipital lobe, very um, anterior area. Typically, it's a stroke that occurs that does that. And then you can also have what's called a temporal crescent with a mom's uh, hemianopsia, um, and that occurs in that location there as well. So um, keep those things in mind, keep those... Um, visual um, patterns in mind so that when we go through cases, then you'll remember where they might be and you can help me localize them tomorrow also. All right. Getting close, yeah. So one last, one last meal. One quick snack no. before you go to the next session. So this will be a very quick, uh, it has to be, it has to be consumed within five minutes. Otherwise, uh, the next session will be delayed. So, um, what can we consume within five minutes? Well, what about this? Okay, so we already talked about how the eight nucleus is connected to the contralateral six nucleus. So now if I come and mischievously, mischievously damage the eight nucleus or the eight vestibular system. This commonly is seen, so those of you who talk, attended the talk yesterday, we were talking about acute vestibular neuronitis. So in acute vestibular neuronitis, in acute vestibular neuronitis, this is exactly what happens, right? 
there is an acute, severe, complete lesion in the vestibular system on the left side. So now that you have figured out these pathways, you should be able to work out what happens to this patient if he has an acute lesion. So again, I'm going to rely on the projection of my voice because you remember there are two, there are two, two sets of gummy circular canals on both sides. We already talked about how they are moving. Okay. So if I move to the left, this side gets more signal because of the greater turbulence. The signal is sent to the contralateral nucleus. My right eye abducts, left eye abducts. When I move to the other side, this side gets more signal. The signal is sent to the opposite six nucleus, left eye abducts, right eye abducts. Okay? But when I'm standing still and looking straight at you, both eyes are resting. So both eyes are resting, but they're not dead. It's not empty, right? Both eyes are resting. So there is resting basal activity. Okay? But when I come and damage one ear, I'm killing one ear. That side is dead. So if this is basal rate, suddenly this side is gone, completely gone. So now this side is firing at basal, B-A-S-A-R, basal rate. So what does the brain think? The brain is going to think that my head is turning to the left because this is the same signal. So the eyes are going to move as if the head is turning to the left. So what happens when my head turns to the left, to the right, sorry? My eyes move to the left, correct? So although my head is steady, because of this, my eyes are going to move to the left, to this side of the room. And then because I'm conscious, I'm thinking, you know, I wanted to look at the gentleman in the blue shirt. So why is my eye drifting slowly to the left? So what do I do? Oh, I bring it back. The moment I bring it back, this, this imbalance is still there. So it's going to drift it back slowly to the left. And then I bring it back again. Oh, then drift back again. Hook, drift back again. Hook, drift back again. Hook, what is this? Slow play, fast play. Slow play, fast play. Slow play, fast play. This is the segment. So let's figure out what are the qualities of this new segment. First of all, which direction is the fast play? Away from the damaged ear. So key feature of peritoneal segment is always keeping away from the diseased ear. Key feature number two is now when I look up, look down, look left, look right, the imbalance is still the same because the problem is in the ear, not in the eye. So will the direction of the segment change? No, it will always be between in the same direction. So non-position changing in segment. Non-direction changing in segment. Non-direction changing in segment. Always keeping in the same direction, no matter what you do. Number three. What is the direction of the nystagmus? Because the semicircular canals are positioned like this. These three died, these three are alive. Now, this guy is going to be firing on its own without anybody to oppose it. But this chap and this chap movement, because one is going up, one is going down, there is some opposition of these two. But it's not complete. If let's say one was up, one was down, they would have cancelled each other out. But one is up and slightly tilted. The other one is down and slightly tilted. So they cancel themselves out to some extent, but not completely. So you're not surprised that in peripheral segment, the predominant component is horizontal. But there is a hint of torsion because these two components are not cancelled out. So classically, unlike Pure horizontal nystagmus, peripheral nystagmus is slightly torsional but predominant horizontal feature. The last feature is the rhombus sign of the eye. So you all know as a neurologist, when patient comes and tells you that they are unsteady, but then they are walking in perfectly well, then you close the eyes and they fall, we call pathology outside the cerebellum, either in the dorsal column or in the peripheral nerve. Because pathology outside the cerebellum, the cerebellum still has the power to use the eye to control balance. But once the cerebellum itself is, un, un, is affected, then the patient, whether his eyes are open or closed, it's not going to make much difference. Because it's already, the cerebellum is not working. So extra input, reduced input, no difference. Right? So the same way, peripheral nystagmus can be suppressed 
by a steady balance. If the vision is intact, correct? If the vision is intact. But the moment the vision is taken away from the patient, the patient cerebellum has got no way of knowing where your eyes are. Because eyeballs have no proprioception like your arm. They only rely on vision. So without vision, the cerebellum will know how am I going to suppress this nystagmus. So the nystagmus becomes much more severe. Okay. So with that, we will see our patient with a classic peripheral nystagmus. Okay, you can see that there is nothing much to see because it's suppressed. And when you look to the right, it's B to the right. It's mixed horizontal rotatory. But when it comes to the center or when it looks to the left, it does not change direction. It's beating away from the left ear. And now, magically, when I close his eyes, his nystagmus becomes much more obvious. His nystagmus becomes much more obvious. This is the Romberg sign of the eye. But then you will tell me, how will I do Romberg sign of the eye if I can't see the eye? Right? This is the only patient in the history of mankind who's got eyes that are, his eyelids are thin enough for you to see. So what do you need? Well, you need something like this, which allows you to take the patient's vision away by putting very thick magnifying glasses in front of the patient. So like this patient's nystagmus is classically peripheral, but nothing to write home about. But the moment I put on these glasses, the nystagmus becomes much more obvious. So this tells me, the Romberg sign of the eye tells me this must be a peripheral nystagmus because if it's central nystagmus, whether the glasses are on or off, it should be the same. If you're not convinced, this will make you convinced. This is a patient with peripheral nystagmus with the glasses on, nystagmus. No glasses, no nystagmus. With glasses, nystagmus. No glasses, no nystagmus. Okay, so in summary, peripheral nystagmus is non-direction changing, fast ways away from the direction of pathology and mixed horizontal rotatory and finally, from both sides of the eye. So with that, I think we have uh, more or less uh, given you what you need to eat today. Now tomorrow when you come back, please try to think about the menu and think about what specific topics you would like to cover. And, and we will do a poll in the morning before we start. And depending on the majority, what, what you want to eat, we will eat. Okay, and because the session is longer, we can have a longer meal. Because tomorrow we go on until noon. Okay, thank you.